This is the Men's Resource Center of Western Massachusetts. So to take on the, uh, the uh, experience, the plight, the challenge of men in our society in all races and all classes um, uh, and all sexual orientations is, is uh, quite a test and I think it's um, uh, a really powerful thing and, and I, it's, it's a model, I think, for what needs to happen throughout the country. What attracts me to the Men's Resource Center is the bold and courageous model which it represents here in our little world here in the valley. <clears throat> and I see this as a, a thrilling and effective model uh, that can be that can inspire other other programs, other places. But I, I am impressed also by this is an organization that, that walks its talk. It uh, doesn't just talk and then go about their daily life. This place, this the, the men who work there are deeply involved in walking their talk. We have cleared off the table. Wash the dishes and put them away. I have told you a story and tucked you in tight at the end of your The basic philosophy of the Men's Resource Center is a combination of confronting violence and abuse and supporting men's uh, healing and love and connection. I think it's, it's a very special organization because uh, since the emphasis is in this connection between men, uh, it creates a very different atmosphere than any other place that I've worked with or had experience, working experience. Uh, I think we make an effort to make a deeper connection. is what we call the Batteries Intervention Program. It's a program for men that have been violent or abusive in their intimate relationships, uh, mainly with, with their partners, but also with children. And uh, um, we are there to, to offer support uh, and you know to offer other alternatives to this kind of behavior. It's a very special Batteries Intervention Program because it emanates from the MRC and the general philosophy of the MRC. On one hand, that we care about men, that we think, we think men are good, and that we want to support them in their change. And on the other, that we'll be very strong about opposing violence and uh, opposing abuse. And that has translate, translated into moving a program in which we have to, to, to find that balance, what you're calling caring confrontation the first MOVE facilitator to actually go through the MOVE program. So I now facilitate groups and I'm in the, um, God, what do we call it now? I do public speaking in regards to talking about my past and uh, domestic violence. Stephen Jefferson was a college basketball star who started his 23 year cycle, 23 years of abuse as a college athlete. So we're talking, Stephen, about, does, did it start in college? Yeah, for yeah. me it did. I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. I had seen in, in my life men do exactly the same thing. That's how you control a woman? Well, I saw my uh, father uh, throw my uh, stepmother into a refrigerator, have the police come to the door, take him, walk around the, the block, bring him back, and he was back at home. But uh, even as a kid, though, didn't you say to yourself as a kid, I won't do that? You Didn't you as a kid think that was wrong? At 36 years old, Oprah, when I was sitting up at the University of Massachusetts in counseling, I said to the counselor, I wanted to do everything in my life not to be like my father, and here I sit today exactly like him. That's the way it happens. That's right. That's the message to the parents is that because you are in the home with the abuse, that's how you learn to deal with the problems. It doesn't matter what people say to you. Can you explain to me what I've not been able to figure out for 10 years of doing this show? Why men think that knocking somebody up against the wall isn't beating them? 
because it gets reinforced in the society in ways in which men get messages that being physical, being abusive is okay, okay. But that's, that's not a bad thing to do. That that's the manly thing to do. I work with men every week, mm -hmm. and I have the men in the group talk about what they think a man really is. And every time I do this, not one man talks about feelings. It's never mentioned. And that's one of the things that men don't talk about, is how they feel. Because I felt very badly the day I saw my stepmother thrown into that refrigerator. I had nobody to talk to about that. Mm -hmm. And many, many times in the incidents that I had, a lot of my rage was because of the fact that that was the only way that I thought that I could express my feeling. Now I know that that's different. I know that there's other ways to get off the cycle of violence. But for 41 years, I didn't have a clue. The only organization, the MRC was that the MRC was the only organization during the time that I was very needy as a black male in the Pioneer Valley that was working, that was actually doing work with men who wanted to change their lives. They gave me, um, it let me know that I could change in terms of the violence in my life. It gave me a context to look at the violence in my life. It gave me, the MOVE group gave me a context to look at how I treated women in my life. And I also learned skills in which to change my behaviors. So now I have two young daughters, I'm married, and I do not think that those things would have happened if I had not found MOVE in the MRC. I'm Dan Rather, and this is 48 Hours. From all appearances, everything seems perfect. But appearances, as we all know, can sometimes be misleading. Good evening. It happens even in the best of homes, some of the worst abuse. Even women we might think less vulnerable by virtue of achievement, wealth, or social standing can become victims of domestic violence. According to the Justice Department, every year, some one and a half million women are targets of abuse by a husband or boyfriend. The feelings of shame about being battered and the fear of retaliation over going public are very much the same for anyone who is living with the enemy. Tonight, the struggle to face the fear and stop the violence. Ask these men. How many of you men, just raise your hand, have been arrested because of domestic violence or had restraining orders? Restraining order. Meet Mike, an antiques dealer. Even though I had always said throughout my life I would never hit a woman, and I'd heard stories about guys that had beat up their partners, I thought, man, what losers. I didn't see myself in that category. I saw myself as reacting. She was very rude to me. The only way he knew how to end an argument with his wife, Debbie, was to hit her. It was my way of saying enough is enough. How did it make you feel when he, when he hit you? When he did the first time, it seemed like all the lights went out on the outside of me. And the second time he hit me, then all the lights on the inside went out. It was dark. Just, I just completely went black. And it was over something very insignificant. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, I do. It was because the <laughs> garage door hadn't been closed properly. Mm -hmm. That's why you hit her? That's, well, yeah. She used to have constant black and blue marks and... You know, it never dawned on me that they were from me. It took Scott two years to admit he had a problem. The very worst part is that our children experience this. That's because experts say children of abusers often grow up to be abusive. And now Scott says his son needs counseling too. It's funny how they pick up the worst things that you can possibly teach them, you know. Sarah Elinoff and Stephen Botkin are working to break the cycle. They are directors of the Men Overcoming Violence program in Western Massachusetts. We've had men in the program who are college professors. I was shocked because I had the idea that men who batter are those men over there. They're not the, the men that I knew. I learned it's everywhere. Counselors here help men realize there's more to being a man than being macho. I don't have to be a kind of Arnold Schwarzenegger model of masculinity. They also teach them how to take a time out. The parts are very simple. I'm feeling angry. I'm going to take a time out. I'll say something like, oh, you need to take a time out. Does it get him to think? Uh, it makes so. him mad. But he, he... Is that true? 
I resent it. Yeah. I'd like to have thought of it myself. <laughs> no, obviously. <laughs> and it just makes me realize that this is not over with. Can you ever get away from this? We have to st constantly stay on top of it. You don't have to throw something in. You don't have to break something. You don't have to go after someone. Anger happens. Your feelings happen. And it's how you choose to deal with them. It's a lot of work to change behavior that's so ingrained. Even the counselors admit more failure than success. These men have been in counseling for years. Are you cured? Cured. <laughs> There's no cure for this. <laughs> but there is hope for some. Life is just better. When I see her now, after work, she's, uh, she's genuinely happy to see me. And I think that, uh, that that is most important. I, I feel mainly because I feel that this work makes a difference. I, I'm a firm believer, you know, the, God, the intuitive uh, side. I know that I'm making a difference. I've, I've seen many men change. And my most exciting workshop was my first workshop. And the reason it was so exciting for me was because of the terror that I was experiencing before I went there. Uh, and what was wonderful about it really was going there indeed with a lot of fear and a lot of fright because I'd never done anything quite like this before. And getting into it and feeling really involved in the workshop as it happened and realizing, oh, I, first of all, I can do this. I can do this well. Uh, I love this. I have a real sense of connection with the young people I'm working with. Um, I understood intuitively what I had only intellectually understood, which was that this is going to be feeding me as well as something, uh, something that was hopefully really helpful to, to the people I was working with. And I found it, found it to be a wonderful experience. Uh, I got a schools, usually in conjunction with uh, a woman's group, such as the Every Woman's Center in Hampshire County, um, to do workshops on abuse and respect in relationships, date rape, sexual harassment. We do some workshops on masculinity that can either be just for men or or mixed groups of women and men. He's like, you're at your age, that's not but not like if I were three years old. is like 25, you're going out, you know? Yeah, but damn, what do you think a man is? When somebody tell you be a man, you can't be eight years old and a man. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's too, that's too young to be saying. But that's, that's what. That's but what is that saying. something? But is that is that something that was ever said to you in yeah, some like, way? Yeah, when I was like seven, seventeen, I was like fourteen. I was like playing baseball and you'd be run from the ball and it's coming your way. Like stop being a a girl and be a man. Go for the ball. So that's another one. Then really, don't be a girl. Yeah. Don't be a girl. I feel like I have the ability to reach people and to change the world or have, you know, help other people break out of the mold or, you know, change their ways uh, in a positive way. And, you know, that's a, an exciting, really exciting, I would, uh, exciting thing for me. I would never want to, like, force someone into changing their ways, but I think that any way, any, any time someone realizes what, what it means to respect and treat other people, another person equally you know I, I think that's a really incredible thing so my goal is to be able to do that as much as possible so what's exciting is that I see there I, I always recognize that at least some of the people in the class really are getting something new and that's a real nice experience to see that they're getting something or sense that they're getting something that they didn't get before um, that for me is maybe the most valuable part of this, or the most precious part of saying, oh yeah, this is really, this teaching really matters. Some, someone's leaving here with something that they didn't have before, and that's wonderful. There are many things that I enjoy about working with men. And um, one piece of it is because as a man myself, I find that um, I get to learn about being a man the more that I reach out to other men and listen to other men and make contact with other men, um, that it helps me to find pieces of myself. We have the men's group project, which is free. It's every week on Sunday evenings at 7 o'clock in our office and um, it's a support group for men to come in and talk about 
um, family, work, love, relationships, um, whatever happens to be. He is always looking to figure out a way to give support to people who might not otherwise get support in ways in which the, the big world kind of like passes folks by. I don't think I could be a part of any organization now after being a part of the MRC that would ever overlook folks who are in need and not put the emphasis and effort into trying to find ways to connect people that in many ways would probably not be connected naturally. And the MRC does a really good job of that. And sexism hurts both men and women, and the Women's Fund and the Men's Resource Center know that in a way that is incredibly foresightful and brave. And I think in this community, in Western Massachusetts, we are doing groundbreaking national work on behalf of men and women, embodying a loving spirit, doing pro-feminist, pro-men work on behalf of each other and ourselves. Thank you. Well, the Men's Resource Center is so brave. I think it's so brave to be here tonight um, and for men to celebrate each other. I love making space for that. I love giving money for that. I love celebrating that. And all of the awkward, fumbling ways in which we go through it that we all learn how to stand up for one another. And I am so thrilled to be part of it. Um, we, as, as Jenny said, have given three grants. Um, we are colleagues. I have been on this um, strategic planning panel. And also, what I've loved is that I've gotten a chance to advocate on behalf of the Men's Resource Center to the Ms. Foundation in New York City and have met with the staff there saying, you have a model worthy of national replication here that should be funded on a national level. <laughs> I see the MRC really expanding and uh, uh, taking on certainly national, if not global, issues mm -hmm. and being a real voice in that. And every time I go to Japan and give it a seminar, give it a talk, I'm, I'm so proud to tell everyone what Men's Resource Center does. And now they know the world's Men's Resource Center, they know what Men's Resource Center does, and they are so proud that men are doing and making a difference. So I, uh, I will always be a lifelong supporter because of what it's meant to me and given me. And I'm just hoping to be able to give as, as much back to other men. I sometimes think that we don't realize how <laughs> privileged we are to be a part of this. Yeah. The Men's Resource Center is funded through a variety of different ways. Um, we're funded by grants. Um, we're funded, we have a membership. Um, so there are community members who support us by, um, by becoming members of our organization. We send them a newsletter and other mailings and invite them to our membership meetings and things of that sort. And that will deepen our ability, our own ability, to have connection. We will deepen our ability to share that connection with other people. Exciting, really exciting. I would, uh, exciting thing for me. I would never want to like force someone into changing their ways, but I think that any way, any any time someone realizes what what it means to respect and treat another another person 